Hi everybody. Looking at your work, I wanted to debrief the difference between doing a problem set and writing up some mathematical results because they are very, very different and I don't think I clearly brought out what that difference was. Um, but I want to now and the grading for next round of projects will reflect what I'm about to say. So a problem set usually has a sequence of specific questions where you just do the work and you put a box around the answer at the end and very often the questions don't really have any connection with each other. Um, I sort of made this look like a problem set because there is a sequence of problems and they're numbered. I tried to emphasize that these were all building to more general things. Um, what I wish I could have done for this expo exploration is actually given you the following prompt. I wish I'd just said, consider the curve 1 over x and consider a line of uh, tangent line to that curve at a point of tangency p. Notice some peculiar facts about the areas and lengths formed by triangles and rectangles on that line, and then generalize your results. That's it. So I so the whole prompt is just to notice some things, prove that they're there, and then generalize. Um, however, I think that if I'd given such a general prompt, a lot of people would have felt um, ungrounded. So that's why I tried to suggest particular things that I noticed and sort of handhold you through the process of generalizing. Um, but, like I said, I think I inadvertently made that seem like it was uh, just doing a problem set. Each one of these features about doing a problem set is not true for the projects that you're going to be typing up for the rest of the year. So in a problem set, the work is for you. Um, the work isn't for the teacher, the work isn't for, you know, an interested reader. It's really just for you to see whether or not you've got the stuff. Um, the end product of your work is an answer. Um, you are answering specific questions rather than general ones, and the questions are typically not connected. So, presenting uh, mathematical work, usually uh, when you write it up, the work is for your mathematical peers. So, um, that's why you have to not just do the work, but present it in the right way. Um, because it's not for you, it's for somebody else. And the end product uh, is supposed to be insight into a general question or a general phenomenon or, or a general technique. Um, the end product is not an answer. So how do you convey insight in your presentation? Um, you're answering a general question, but the way that you convey the insight is typically by alternating between your results and illustrations of your results. So you're going to connect your general answer to specific questions or problems or answers. Um, to illustrate the general insight and show kind of how that insight shows up in different looking circumstances. So I want to kind of show you what that looks like for this particular project you just turned in. <clears throat> so this is what it looks like to do the work correctly as if it were a problem set. See how it just says one and then just launches right in f of x equals blah and like blah 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 and then at the end like that's the answer. Um, I mean, this person does have one sentence that says, because all are equal, this line always bisects. Um, but really this isn't, you know, nobody else would want to read this. This doesn't like clearly present any results. Um, this is like kind of one click better. At least this student wrote what it was that they were doing. Um, but this is just a direct copy from my prompt, either prove P, always bisects L, or find a counterexample to this claim. Um, and now this student is sort of like laying some foundations, saying before we can do it, we've got to define our things, and then goes on from there. Um, but even this is not really quite what I have in mind. This is a more succinct version of that same idea. So this student starts with the question, does P always bisect L? Claim. Yes, P always bisects L. To prove this, we can use coordinates for P and the intercepts of line L, and then sort of goes on to... So both of those presented the specific, each specific problem. This student has, has made sort of a more general introduction to the entire concept of the thing. So this student is saying, for this project, I explored some interesting properties of this function for positive X values, um, and then sort of here's what they all have in common. You can sort of define terms like this, and then on from there. So that's pretty common in actual mathematical papers. So I just jumped on um, a preprint server here. So this is a recently published mathematical paper, or maybe even about to be published, October 2017. Um, and you won't understand a lot of these words, but I just want to point, so this is called uh, of the local stability of semi-definite relaxations. Um, so I just want to point out kind of what does the structure of this look like. So the very first sentence of the abstract says, in this paper, we consider a parametric family of polynomial optimization problems. 
So they're kind of setting up, like, in general, what is the kind of thing that we're going to be exploring. And then they go on to say some more specific things about it. If we sort of scroll down here a little bit, notice that right away they have example one. So an example is not actually the answer to the question they were asking. It's not a result that they're proving. Um, it is an example to illustrate an idea that they want your, the readers to understand. Um, so in our paper, there was definitely like ideas that connected between the different problems that you would have wanted to sort of present. So they've got an example and they're saying like, blah, 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 I'm setting up the problem. And then here they're saying, um, here's what we're going to show in this example. We're going to show that when theta is sufficiently close to y, then like something's going to happen. So again, the form of that um, was what was missing from a lot of people's papers. Uh, a lot of people didn't say, like, here's the scenario, and we're going to show that regardless of the value of p, the area of the blah, blah, blah is like blah, blah, blah. A little further down in the paper, they actually start with their results. So theorem one, this is a new result that they're showing. And then notice after that, they have another example that kind of illustrates theorem one in action so that you can kind of wrap your head around it. So, so this is like really, really different than doing a problem set. I mean, yes, they've got solutions to problems, but the answers to the specific problems are not what they're trying to convey. They're trying to convey more general insight into something. And the specific answers to specific questions serve as illustrations, but those need to be linked together by, by more substance. This student tried to do something like that. They definitely paid attention to my prompt that said you need to have a sequence of observations and sort of connect them to a general point. But if we look at the observations, the observations are actually just the steps in the problem solving process to answer the question. So they're kind of making an observation that the derivative of one over x is uh, negative one over x squared. Well, I mean, yeah, in a certain sense, that's an observation. Um, but that's kind of a standard technique that we use all the time. So it's not, it's not an observation in the sense that I'd intended. Um, the sense that I'd intended is it's an observation that wouldn't necessarily be obvious to, to your mathematical peers, to people who had been working together with you, but not on this specific question. This student has summarized a whole bunch of their observations in a table. So uh, given the equation 1 over x to the n for different n values, these are the results that connect back to the work um, that they had on previous pages. So they said, sort of, here's the ratio, here's the rectangle area, here's the triangle area. Um, and then they have some kind of general conclusions down here. And you'll notice this is a correct, like, most people did the mathematics correctly and say it sort of, they got to the end and they just put a box around this number. Um, but they didn't do a lot of work sort of showing how do you think about what this means. Um, and this table isn't necessarily like the A++ best version of that, um, but it's going in the right direction. It's, it's providing an illustration for how do you think about this or interpret it um, in a range of possible cases to where it might apply. Several people included beyond just algebra, they included other ways of illustrating the insight. So, um, for this student, I really liked how this picture captures some of the, the major distances and shows the relationships between them. So a lot of people calculated that the x-intercept here was 2a, um, but they didn't really make the connection and show that that's actually twice the distance of this. And 2 over a, that height, is twice the distance of this height, 1 over a. And that's a really important observation to make because that geometric relationship is part of what we're going to be generalizing um, in the problem. Later on, the student actually presents the exact same diagram, only now it's generalized, and they're showing um, they're showing all those same distances and how they relate. I think this put together with the table, and then uh, some indication of I mean, this is the exact same geometry, so this picture is not to scale. Uh, and it can't be to scale because it's general n. But part of what I would have hoped that you wanted to convey is as n changes, we know that this curve stops being symmetric and starts skewing to one side. So kind of how does that affect the overall ratios of things? Um, and I think this is a fantastic thing to have, but having like a couple of little sketches 
that attached to the table of results from the previous problem would have really, really brought that point out. A final comment is uh, some students in the class are actually very comfortable with uh, presenting mathematical arguments, either um, in the setting of tests or in the setting of like writing papers. Um, and this is like a very clean presentation of the argument. Starts out by saying we're going to generalize the results and then makes the claim and then the proof follows and it's all very clear cut, all very logical. And then at the end we can see that the blah blah blah, here's what we've proven. So. I'm not trying to indicate that this is bad, and actually, um, in a lot of papers, it does take this exact form. The type of writing that I want you to do is not exactly the same as what you would write if you were proving something in a contest. It's not exactly the same as what you would write if you were writing up mathematical results in a published paper. It's more similar to that latter one, um, but instead of being for an audience of professional mathematicians, it's for an audience of your peers in the class which means that I want you to do a little bit, a little bit more illustrating um, using different representations than would probably appear in a professional publication. Because if you're, if you're writing for your mathematical peers and you're all professional mathematicians, it's not, it's not typical to illustrate general results with a slew of concrete examples, and it's not typical to, to use a whole bunch of representations necessarily. But I think for the level of mathematician that we're at right now, I think that would be, um, that would be appropriate. So I will have uh, revised instructions um, for how you're going to write up this next round, um, but I hope that this has made sense of kind of what's the, what's the logic behind how we're presenting this work.